everybody. You are back. It is Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live podcast. You can find me, Jack Murphy, at Jack Murphy Live on Twitter, JackMurphyLive.com, Jack Murphy Live all over the internet, actually. I planned it exactly that way. You can also come check me out at the Liminal Order. That's liminal-order.com. That is our international all-men's male fraternity where we work hard to improve ourselves so that we can be of better service to our families, our community, and our nation. And today I have a fantastic guest, somebody I have been really looking forward to talk to. His name is Michael Millerman. He has a PhD in political science. Uh, he has studied philosophy. He has his own similar story as I do of finding challenges in this world of studying things and exploring ideas and just taking a look at what's around us in this world and finding resistance uh, and especially in academia. So today we're going to do a special podcast. I'm calling it Dugan for Dummies, and that's Alexander Dugan, the Russian philosopher. Uh, to be honest, I don't really know too terribly much about Alexander Dugan uh, or his relationship with Heidegger. Uh, and so I am interested to learn a lot more about that. And uh, I'm so excited to have you here, Michael. How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Doing Fantastic. well. Pretty excited. G- great. Good. Good. Uh, I want to set the table a little bit with a, a little bit of your background story. Uh, you have an experience that is similar to a lot of other folks these days, people uh, to folks who are people who are out sort of on the edge, uh, willing to engage with ideas that they may not agree with, willing to engage with ideas that people may find radical. Uh, are off the wall. Uh, and so you've experienced a little bit of cancel culture yourself. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I think the story it starts about uh, while well, you're trying to get your PhD. Is that right? Yeah, it goes back a little bit earlier. So let me just set it up. Um, yeah. I was an undergraduate in philosophy at the University of British Columbia. And I was studying basically Plato, Aristotle, some of the main texts you study when you do a program in uh, philosophy. And at some point, I got the interest in learning technical philosophical vocabulary in Russian. And the reason I got that interest is that my family is from the former Soviet Union. We spoke some Russian in the household growing up. And I had been even um, vaguely aware of some tradition of Russian mysticism and sort of these Russian religious thinkers uh, in the 19th century, like Vladimir Solovyov, for example, is one of them. And I developed this interest in knowing, for example, how to say the key terms of a philosophical lexicon in Russian. So in English, you know, there's like, I mean, you may or may not know, there's uh, substance, accident, essence, existence, all the, te- all the terms that have been passed down from Greek to Latin and eventually to English, I wanted to know them in Russian. So I proposed to do a translation of some Russian philosopher in my department. And I got the green light to do that. They said, just find a a uh, contemporary Russian philosopher and an older Russian philosopher. And you can do that. We'll work with you to translate them and see what comes out of it. So at this time, I did not know who Alexander Dugin was. Yeah, it was my task to go try to find a contemporary philosopher because this guy I had an interest in didn't really count. You know, 1900 is a little bit before our time. That's when mm-hmm. Solovyov uh, died. So at the same time, I was reading a journal called um, Azure. A-Z-U-R-E. Okay. And I encountered an article there called Alexander Dugit, Dugin, Prophet of a New Russian Empire. Something like that. Okay? okay. And this article was just gripping, really gripping, because it said that Dugin was this sort of mystical philosopher king who you couldn't understand Russia if you didn't understand its deepest identity, its spiritual uh, soul, and that Dugin was really your window into that deep understanding of Russia. So the article had touched a few things that are just personally deeply very interesting to me. Again, the figure of the philosopher king, which comes from Plato's Republic and is just, you know, as I was studying in the department, that was one of the things that stood out for me, the idea that you have the wise should be the legislators, you know, or the wise should be the ones who can figure political life. So all of that came out in this article. Uh, Another thing that was really as I say, gripping, was there was a story that he had been kicked out of Ukraine. I mean, because he has some thoughts about Ukrainian geopolitics that don't necessarily square with their own self-understanding. And that the same day that he was kicked out of Ukraine, the Russian government expelled Ukrainian ambassador and his family from Russia. So there was to see like that a state has the back of this weird mystical philosopher 
who somehow has penetrated the depths of the Russian soul. All of that was just that was just interesting. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I looked them up and I found a speech of his. This must have been 2010 or 11. I couldn't say exactly. Something around that time. I looked him up and I found a speech. It was a five minute talk on YouTube about something he called the fourth political theory. Right. Something he's known for now because a book called The Fourth Political Theory was published in 2012 and I helped to translate it, which got the ball rolling for all of these, uh, all of the cancel culture blowback. Right. But at the time, it was just an interesting lecture I heard, you know, right. so that I basically went on his Russian Wikipedia, saw he had a book called The Fourth Political Theory, ran it by my supervisor and said, why don't we start here? You know, this, seemed, this is all I know about the guy. It's really fascinating. That five minute lecture also pulled me in for reasons I can explain. And he said, sure, let's do it. I started translating the book. Eventually, he, uh, my supervisor encouraged me to get in touch with Dugan about having the translation published because this supervisor, again, at, at the undergraduate level, he was amazed. This was right at the time that Vladimir Putin was basically announcing that Russia was going to adopt Dugan's ideology as its official uh, worldview. Right. So he's reading this and he's saying, oh, my God, this is amazing. You have to get this published. Right. So he said, email, email Dugan, reach out to him and see what's going on. So I did. I shot he him, said, a, I shot he him a message. Him an email. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I first tried finding like his phone number at the time he was at Moscow State University. It was very hard to try to track him down. Somehow, I, I can't remember. I found his email address, shot him an email. And he said, there's already a translation underway that was under, under contract with a publishing house called Arctos. So I got in touch with them and they said, hey, let's take what you've done of the translation with what we've done of the translation. We have a conference coming up shortly. We'd love to have the book ready by then. Let's combine what we have and what you have and we'll put this out. This was in July 2012. So they did. I was thrilled. Undergraduate. Okay. First official book translation of Alexander Dugan in English. I'd made my contribution. I thought it was very um, interesting. So did my supervisor. Got it published. You know, I was so glad to see on the inside cover my name i felt like i was making a contribution to political theory and i took that going into my master's and phd program saying hey look i'm translating russian political philosophy i'm putting this guy on the table i'm helping you understand something that is crucial geopolitically politically and philosophically like what more could you basically want i thought they were going to eat this up because right. my understanding perfect. is basically it sounds perfect right? right so i wore it on my sleeve i told the people at the university of toronto where i did my master's and phd that uh, that i'm doing this Dugan wrote me a letter of reference to get into the program because, as I say, he was an academic at the time, uh, among other things. And I continued to translate. But by the time word got out that Toronto has this expert on Dugan's thought, um, I was invited onto a Canadian television program for an interview about him. An article had just come out called Putin's Brain, positioning Dugan as the mastermind of, not wrongly, really, uh, as the mastermind of Putin's geopolitical vision uh, in Ukraine and, and around the world. And so this TV program invited me on for an interview. I did it. I thought it went well. They thought it went well. And suddenly it started to circulate. You know how these things work. Mm -hmm. uh, people were amazed. I still get letters. This was to December 2014. I still get emails. I still get letters from people saying that was like eye opening for them. They had never heard a Russian perspective or a critical perspective or a thinker on the right, a conservative, a traditionalist, they had never heard any of that presented just on like for what it is, like to, to try to understand it, to try mm. to articulate it and to try to present it. All of, they either thought, you know, you look at whether it's, you know, you look at Russia, or you look at conservatives, you look at traditionalists and all you do is say we're fascists, neo-fascists, Nazis, you know, this logic. Right. Anything that doesn't fall into the status quo is somehow outside of it is automatically branded. And that's funnily enough what happened when I came back to the university after the TV interview. So I gave the interview. People around the world are writing to me. It's blowing up. It was one of their big well blowing up. It's almost had 100,000 views, which for that particular station is not so bad. And then before too long, I got hauled into the offices of my dissertation supervisor at the University of Toronto and the railroading began. All right, before we before we get too much further with that, can you turn the gain down on your on your microphone just a smidge, and can you explain why it is that it's important that you have like a committee, like your PhD committee? I'm not sure everybody understands that. Yeah, is that better? 
Yeah, that's better. Okay, sorry about that. Great. No problem. Um, yeah, so there. in a in a graduate program, what you do is you spend three or four, or some people spend more, but let's say three to four years on a major research project. And usually the way it works is you have one supervisor who works with you on that project. They basically take you under their wing. You share your uh, your chapters with them and they give you critical feedback. They're your closest point of contact. But in order down the road to defend that dissertation, which you have to do to, to graduate from the program, you have to do it before a committee of members. And those members sign an agreement with you at the proposal stage. So first you propose the project you want to do. It's like a 20 page proposal, for example. They say, sign off. They say this is going to be a contribution to the literature. This is methodologically sound. It's interesting. And uh, yeah, you know, we're we're here to have you d defend this. And then off you go, you do the research and hopefully at the end of three years, you have something that you can defend in order to graduate. So I was in that process, but I was very early in it. I just had the proposal accepted. So I had the committee, people who had agreed to work with me. They knew I was into Dugan. I've been talking about it. Well, I hadn't been talking about it since I got there, but you know, I mentioned it because I was proud of it. Mm -hmm. I was getting good grades. So there's no issue there about all of the technicalities were in order. Right. Uh, my teaching reviews were good as a TA. So everything this was is place. University of Toronto, right? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, uh, and it's fine if you don't, University of Toronto is it's important in, for a few reasons, actually, because number one, it's considered the best school in Canada. So you would expect this to be the place where you have the most serious examination, especially in a department of. OK, I was in a department of political science by now. And the way political science works is there are subfields. So somebody works on international relations. Somebody can work on development studies, American politics. My subfield of, of political science is called political theory. Mm -hmm. That's where the philosophy happens. That's where you do the careful readings of uh, theoretical texts of classics and all of that. And so the fact that um, my work was so badly received, not because of its qual quality, but, but because of the logic of cancel culture here in a way, right? Somehow yeah. I touched a nerve and it wasn't supposed to happen because the Department of Political Science at the best university in Canada in that subfield where you're supposed to think is the last place in principle you would expect or where I expected to have the kind of reaction that um, that, that TV interview eventually got. Right. So what year was this that you were putting your committee together? So they had signed off. It was either late 2014 or early 2015. So pretty much right at the time that I gave the interview, yeah. I had already had the project accepted. I already had a chapter that got a pretty good review from my supervisor. In fact, I think he said it was quite good, really good. And I had a whole committee. So I was sailing, actually. I felt and, I thought that I was and, sailing. And for context, isn't University of Toronto where Jordan Peterson was? Yes, it is. Yes, it yeah. is. But, but that his his uh, sort of fiasco came a little bit later, a couple of years later now. Yeah, it's funny because some online conspiracy theorists who later learned that I was there and he was there. We both work on Heidegger. You know, they started to draw a connection that he's secretly a Duganist and things like that. But, yeah. you know, you can count on the conspiracy <laughs> theorists to draw connections uh, at, at will. Right, right. OK, so they everybody starts to find out what you're doing. You, everything seems like it's going to be moving ahead full steam. And then what happens? Yeah, so I got an email that said from my supervisor that said, hey, I'd like to have a meeting with you in the office. And do you mind if this other professor who's not on my committee joins? I said, no, nope, no problem at all. You know, let's have the meeting. And I got to tell you, in retrospect, it is what it is. But at the time, I thought, <laughs> this is great. These guys are calling me in because I just sent them my chapter, which is, they, you know, my supervisor said the chapter was great. So I said, look, I'm ahead of the curve. Things are going well for sure we're going to be planning out like my next steps this is all about you know me finishing in four years instead of five and about planning out my next professional steps like i was sure that this was all a, a gravy you know i did not see the bus coming okay <laughs> so i went into his office and very somberly you know closes the door sits down michael i saw your video <laughs> on that tv program and I have something I'd like to say to you. He takes out a piece of paper. He says, I'm too emotional. I can't even say this to you. I had to write it out as a letter, and I'm, now I'm going to read it to you. Whoa. Okay? And he starts reading me this letter that he wrote to me with his witness that he, now I understand. You know, he called a witness, so his ass is protected. 
Whereas I wasn't given the chance to have anything uh, like that for my own protection, so to speak. So he starts reading me this letter. And, you know, it's... When I first heard about Dugan, I just thought it was this harmless thing. But then I looked him up and I see he's... He... And then it started. Are you an anti-Semite? Do you support this? Are you exterminationist? You know, don't you know that he would want to do this to me? And how can you do that? And it just... Every accusation under the sun, up to and including that I'm being used by the Russians. So this was a total, total blindside. And uh, I, the only thing I regret is I wish I had said, you know, you've you've hit so many, so many points that are just going to give me cause to reflect here. Can I just just have a copy of the letter so I can take it home and you know go over it and do some soul searching? Because that letter was a real work of art. But I didn't mm. I didn't get a copy of the letter. But he he poured out his soul to me out of concern. And um, it was pretty shocking, actually. So the next day, uh, I think like he emailed me and he said again, how, how can you be involved with this guy in any way? And I responded that, look, here's the here's my philosophical interest in the guy. Here's here's the justification. Like it's pretty it's pretty straightforward from my perspective. And uh, and really quickly, he he resigned from the committee and then another member resigned from the committee. And I had the beginning of what was going to be like at minimum uh, six months to a year of like deep hell at the campus where mm. I didn't have any supporters except for one this one committee member who later became my supervisor. She was like the bright light. She stood by my side. She was appalled that these guys would resign. She thought there was no justification, no ground for it, that they were betraying all of their principles. And you got to understand there are a million nuances here. Like one of the members who resigned was a Straussian who, in principle, is open to the study of serious political philosophy. Another one of them, about a week before he quit the committee, he had given a public speech in which he said that in a liberal democracy, like ours, there's no need for anybody to censor themselves because there's no persecution for heterodox thought in a liberal democracy. The <laughs> same person who said that one week later resigned from the committee and ba effectively blacklisted me from academia. Now, at the University of Toronto, do they bat an eye when somebody wants to study, I don't know, another lay of Marx, for example? Not only do they not bat an eye, you know, they welcome with open arms to a certain extent projects like that. And I'll say, in addition, you know, if you want to study Islamic fundamentalist political theory, which exists, okay, you could do that. If you want to study pretty much any radical political theory, especially on the left, or multicultural radicalism, okay? If it's Aboriginal radicalism or something like that, that's fine. If it is, uh, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? All of that is fine. But somehow a Russian Orthodox conservative Platonist, but who's not a liberal and doesn't fit into, you know what I mean? So somehow yeah. that just, there was no way of making sense of it. And they all lost, uh, they all lost their minds. And it was, it was a pretty wild ride. So I, I, we're obviously going to get into the to the meat of it all, but I want to just tie this into a conversation I just had with James Lindsay uh, the other day, who uh, has been writing a lot about his new book is called Cynical Theories, and it's all about how postmodernism went from an art aesthetic all the way into applied postmodern theory and then into sort of a reified godlike religious circumstance uh, of philosophy and uh in there you know they make basically they're arguing against liberal uh liberal uh, political economy liberal thinking liberal societies uh through these philosophies to what extent do you think that there is an anti-liberalism uh strain running through the university of toronto even if it's hidden or obscured uh to what extent is it actually anti-liberal well look here here's the here's the thing so if the postmodern left has an anti-liberal animus and it has infiltrated certain departments or just established certain departments and it's sometimes taken over whole uh, you know, faculties or even whole uh, institutions, uh, let's say all of that is accurate, okay? But here's the thing. Usually you have a setup like you have the postmodern left attack on liberalism, science, rationality, freedom, rights, and that tradition. But what happened at the University of Toronto did not fall into that because the people who kicked me off the committee, I mean, you know, who resigned the committee and basically, as I say, effective blacklist from academia, they were not on the postmodern left and neither am I. So this takes the whole logic of a campus culture war and expands it to something that's less familiar, which mm. is that you had basically like 
center left liberals, okay, and center liberals, the, some of the people who are on the committee, and me doing research on somebody who criticizes liberalism, but not, not from the left. Okay, so it'll be important to understand something about where Dugan falls on the spectrum of political theories to, to see this more clearly. But basically, you could say, this is a bit of a distortion, but still helpful, that this was liberals at, on campus blacklisting the study of right-wing anti-liberalism. So again, usually the tension is between the left, the postmodernists and the scientists, but here it was between the liberals and the right of liberal critics. Now you don't get a lot of right of liberal critics seriously studied in academia. And even though it's much easier for a student, let's say to name like Zizek, Derrida, Foucault, Marx, and m many other thinkers, if you said to them, okay, that's the sort of the tradition of the postmodern left. Now, can you name to me some serious thinkers who represent the right right wing alternative to liberalism? They probably will not be able to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. but at least we would have to say Nietzsche, Heidegger, Carl Schmitt, Alexander Dugan, and to a certain extent, Leo Strauss. So it's a smaller universe, but it always seems to me, how are we going to understand what liberalism is and what the threats to liberalism are if we're only always looking to the left? And when we look to the right, all we see is fascism or Nazism. Well, it's more nuanced than that, because these figures on the right are not identical to one another, and they often disagree with one another. Strauss was very critical of Schmidt. Schmidt and Heidegger are not the same thing. Dugan is his own story. So there was this undiscovered territory on the right, and I, and I thought, basically, like uh, Socrates, when he had to propose his punishment, he said, you guys should all give me like a penthouse suite and, uh, you know, $5,000 a month reward for what I've shown you. Obviously, they chose a different way. Uh, so I thought similarly, you know, I said, look, you guys have been completely missing the picture on right wing anti liberalism. And I'm giving you not just access to the figures who belong to that tradition inherently, like Nietzsche, let's say, but Alexander Dugan, a completely unique phenomenon that will help you to understand the possible spectrum of political theory. Right. And uh, they didn't see it that way. You know, it's funny. I the circles I run in, the people I talk to, I hear Heidegger and Nietzsche, Strauss. I hear these names and ideas thrown around so much that it doesn't even. I don't even stop for a second to think that it's like a radical thing to think about or out of the box or something wild. Well, look. My, let me uh, just say on that point. I mean, it's yeah. one of the reasons I feel more at home outside of academia now because I spent so many years there. Okay, through my undergraduate, with the masters, the PhD, that. The, the environment, on one hand, there's the serious study of old text, and there is, to some extent, you know, high standards of scholarship, but it, there's a much fresher and freer air outside of academia. I have met people, and I've spoken to people, this conversation that we're having now, where it's not only more respectful, it is truer to the thought, it's truer to the text, it, it's not so dogmatically uh, closed at the outset that it can't possibly learn anything. And, mm. and I wasn't expecting that at the university, but unfortunately, I found that other people find it in different ways for different reasons. And I think this space that you're helping to create and that other people are involved in um, outside of academia, where ideas, they don't have to be on the right, but they but if you're thinking some of them will be on the right, some of them will be on the left, some of them will be elsewhere, maybe mm. a completely different topography altogether. Um, I think outside of the university is where that is happening, where it's going to continue to happen. And I can tell you that there were students who came to me after class when I was a TA and who just still email me now all the time. And they know that the university is not the place where they can genuinely think. That's a damn shame, but it's also right. a fact. And it's an yeah. opportunity for the people like yourself and, um, and others, as I say, who are keeping the conversation alive in, in print and through podcasts and by video. And it's quite exciting. And as I say, uh, a big relief for me in a way finally to have left. I haven't burned my bridges with academia. I still respect, as I say, some components of it. But the purest thought is not happening there. Yeah, uh, it, it is unfortunate, but it is yet another example of how uh, there's emerging networks of people uh, and, and expertise and understanding and action uh, in in almost every realm that is superseding the established institutions. So whether it's dealing with Corona, COVID, trying to understand what's going on there or dealing with political issues or economic issues or philosophical issues or or just the study of knowledge or whatever it is, the, the networks that are forming outside of the institutions are weird that where the real evolution is, where the action is, where the answers are, where the solutions are going to be found. Uh, and it's an 
exciting place to be. Um, I couldn't imagine being on campus right now, uh, not not in the least. I, I'm actually doing my own version of backfilling my gaps in my education. This conversation is one of them, on, uh, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to sort of learn the things that I didn't learn along the way in school, both my master's and, and bachelor's. Um, but I, I wanted to ask a question about the context. Why, why do you think that there was such pushback to studying uh, Dugan? Do you, was it related, do you think, to Trump and Trump's alleged, you know, collusion with, uh, with Putin and Russia and like some great fear that there was going to be like a, a, a Russian takeover of Western democracy? I mean, it's so dumb to say, but so a, a takeover of Western democracy or some sort of new dirty alliance between the United States and Russia or something that Dugan had something to do with. Do you think it was related to Trump at all or did it precede Trump by just a smidge or... What, is it related? It is related. And okay. it's related. <laughs> it's not the only factor, but it's definitely yeah. one of the factors. So the, the supervisor who resigned first, the next book that he wrote was called Dangerous Minds, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and the Return of the Far Right. So okay. smack on the concern. And it's the cover of the book is the Charlottesville. Um, oh, boy. Okay. So for him, it's like I- immediately related. Heidegger, Dugin, Nazis, Tiki Torches, it's all the same soup, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, so that was one part of it. Another yeah. person who resigned from the committee, he told me at one point, look, he told me this in, in uh, private in the coffee shop resignation meeting. He said, my son is fighting Islamic terrorists in the Middle East, and you're working on Dugin who supports Islamic terrorists in the Middle East, and therefore there's this unbridgeable gap between us. We just, we can't work together because you're on the side of the enemy, effectively which was, well, I mean, I'll let people make their own judgment about whether. Yeah, whether that's reasonable. I mean, yeah. I'm over here shaking shaking my head in disgust. There's no, there was no, uh, no space given to just understanding that you have to, even if you don't agree, if even if you think that they're your enemy, it behooves you to study them in depthly. There was no, no credence given to that. Very little, uh, to put it kindly. But one, so one other thing is that Dugan himself is a multifaceted character. So mm. if somebody were, I mean, now maybe it's different. I don't know. But at that time, if you were just to Google Alexander Dugan, pull him up on Wikipedia, you might get the impression, you know, from whatever comes up first, that he is, uh, to quote, you know, somebody's characterization of him and Applebaum, a crackpot, you know, or some, you could get a bad first impression of him if you just pull him up on Wikipedia. And they may have thought that my interest in him was that I Googled something, uh, you know what I mean? And, and he came up and that I'm attracted to him because he once did an interview with Ahmadinejad or something like that. But the thing is that he is, as I say, multifaceted. And I came to his works from the top down, you know, from the theoretical, the philosophical. And I have to tell you this interesting story. So his, he has written about Heidegger. He has a few books on Heidegger. One of them was published in English. That's not one that I translated, although I translated many others. And when, again, at the university, somebody uh, found out that this person had a book on Heidegger, the rumor circulated and got back to me he, that he had said, it's not possible that Dugan wrote that Heidegger book because you can't have a person who at the same time writes serious works of political philosophy and does like what we can just call here like shit posting or you know something right. like something like that in brief right that can't be the same person therefore someone else might must have written his heidegger book and he thought it had been me so he, <laughs> i was supposedly the ghost writer of uh dugan's first heidegger book but in fact it's just that dugan is a complicated multifaceted figure he's as comfortable lecturing about phenomenology aristotle plato and heidegger on one hand in ways that are very good so he's a great, I think, lecturer, and he knows his material very well. And at the same time, you know, he can turn off his interview and go on the Alex Jones show and be talking some something that is uh, less familiar to an academic audience, let's say, you know, and they weren't able to put those two things together. So the Trump thing, yes, the Russia thing, yes, the fact that they were faced with someone who doesn't fit the model of an academic political philosopher, all of that was a part of it. And I got to tell you, as much as I learned writing the dissertation, which was a lot. And as much as I learned reading all of these people and translating Dugan, which I did and enjoyed and continue to do, 
seeing how these professors reacted to the whole thing was probably the most instructive uh, experience mm. that I had on campus because it just was every hypocrisy. And I held I held Straussians. I mean, I still hold Strauss in this regard, but I held Straussians in like the highest regard because I thought that they were the most willing to look into philosophical questions without turning their backs on them and running away from them. And uh, here I definitely had a um, mugged by reality type moment, but not in the usual way. Right. Well, you know, anybody who's interesting and worth talking to these days seems to have a similar story, a similar story like this. You know, they say if uh, if you're not getting hate, you're not in the right place. or You're not on the right track. So clearly you should take it as a sign that you're doing something interesting, uh, something worthwhile. Because all the guys, people, if you don't get any hate, if you don't get any pushback, what are you doing? It's boring. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And that's a, you know, it's a terrible way to live your life, like using that as a metric. Right. Like, but, you know, once the hate does start coming, you have to actually think of it as a po- as a positive sign and for me i mean i had antifa come after me i got docs i got fired i got called a nazi and a racist and all this stuff and that wasn't for studying dugan or heidegger an actual nazi it was for for, for just talking about whether or not we should have sanctuary cities like you know should our local jurisdictions disregard federal law like that that seems like a pretty reasonable question to me uh but uh, i got fired for it anyway but it was a blessing in disguise it's almost two years ago and uh you know now i get to do this every day uh for my living so it's uh it's been been able to turn it around um and i'm hoping that you will be able to turn that experience around and i guess uh we didn't finish the story but you know i guess you found some people who were gonna who ended up coming onto the committee and 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 standing standing by your side to get this work done that's right it divided the department uh divided the faculty there were realignment of uh friendships and of everything like that but eventually i had i had a very supportive committee and you know i had originally planned it that i would have like roughly a leftist a liberal and a conservative so that i was speaking to a whole spectrum um i ended up having like uh, yeah a postmodern africanist a rabbi and you know so, so, so a very interesting group of people but but the dividing line was those who think students must be subject to an ideological test and those who support the philosophical merit of genuine inquiry so i ended up it was a blessing in disguise it's continued to be like i say i've met so many good people yourself included this is great and uh, I met so many good people as a result of what happened. I continue to get letters and emails. It's fantastic. I have, I shudder when I think about what my life would have been like if I had remained on the academic trajectory where I had to watch my step, where I had to watch my mouth. I mean, I still do, obviously, to a certain extent, but not like it was there. There, there was um, basically just a gag order. Right. You know, I'm thinking back, one of my early philosophy classes was all about Marx. And I know we actually studied on the Jewish question, and I can't even remember what my professor said about it. But it was a generally positive Marx class. So I wonder, I got to go back and check my notes. It's just crazy to think that I, I remember now looking back, I remember reading Marcusa and like reading clear, clear critical theory and all kinds of stuff. And it was all presented to me totally as just this is the way the world is. This is the, you know, don't even question it. There was, it was just all given as a given. Uh, and I'm having to go back and, and rejigger my mind. So let's let's get started actually with the material about uh, Dugan and Heidegger and Strauss. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you quick, I asked this of Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute as well, who's the Straussian guys. What, what do you mean when you say Straussian? Because I hear that term thrown around and I know my audience hears it thrown around too. What what, what does that mean? What is that general outlook or what does that say about somebody if you call them a Straussian? Okay, here's how I would put it. So first of all, Straussians are those people who share uh, a, a view that Leo Strauss was a masterful interpreter of the texts of political philosophy from Plato to Nietzsche. So okay. not everybody shares that view. There are people who think that Strauss's way of reading texts is illegitimate or misleading. But for the most part, people who call themselves Straussians share Strauss's view of how to read these texts. And what that means is that you read them with the utmost respect. You don't assume just because someone wrote before you that they knew less than you. So just because mm. someone wrote in a medieval period and therefore didn't have the benefits of modern understanding that we have, that we can only read them to learn from their mistakes and not to learn the truth about political life or about human life that we may have lost in the period between then and now. So one principle of reading is the utmost respect for what a great thinker has written. You don't try to interpret him in terms of the surrounding culture. 
because you can't really make sense of the surrounding culture without understanding the works of the great thinkers that belong to it. So to try to understand a thinker in light of his culture is sort of to put the cart before the horse to a certain extent. Hmm. You see, you can't understand hmm. a- a- Athens if you don't understand Plato. It's not the other way around to, to, an hmm. exer- to a certain extent. So something else about Straussians is that they see a conflict. Again, this is a generalization, but a- applicable you know, for that reason uh, most of the time. A conflict between philosophy and law or philosophy and politics because politics is the domain of opinion and philosophy tries to transform opinion into knowledge that can have the effect of undermining the beliefs that are necessary for political community or undermining the foundations of a legal order because you're questioning what maybe should be taken as an axiom so the conflict between philosophy and politics or between philosophy and law is a theme for straussians as is the relationship or the tension between philosophy on one hand and revelation on the other. So the life lived according to what man can know by himself with his own efforts and the life lived according to obedience to a superhuman authority. And it's not trivial because the divine law or the revealed law or the role of religious belief has been of decisive importance for Western tradition. So the theme of philosophy versus uh, law, philosophy versus revelation is crucial. And incidentally, it's also related to how Strauss reads texts because his view was that, let's say that I'm a member of a religious community. I'm a medieval Islamic thinker. And I'm also a philosopher. So I now live in a community constituted by the Sharia, by the revealed law of the revealed code of Islamic law, or in the Jewish context, by the Torah, by the, you know, the revealed code of Jewish law. And at the same time, I see that it rests on certain um, assumptions, like, for example, that the world is created as opposed to eternal, for example, okay, or that there's a resurrection of the body or the soul. So there are certain beliefs that are inherent to these religious communities. But as a philosopher, I, in this example, can't rest, can't leave it at the belief. I actually have to think about it, right? Is the, maybe, the, maybe the arguments for the eternity of the world are stronger than the arguments that the world was created. After all, they have in their favor Aristotle, who's, who's no random person, right? He's a pretty serious thinker. He didn't think the world was created. We got to take him seriously. But as a thinker in that context, I can't just come out and undermine the beliefs that hold the community together. So Strauss said, in such circumstances, a philosopher sometimes will employ strategies of writing that basically communicate two messages. One message to the superficial reader and another message to the far smaller set of slow, thoughtful, careful readers. And he made more, he put more on the table than anybody else had done before, the methods of writing that a philosopher in that situation will use. So for example, deliberate contradictions, Um, another method that he mentions is that sometimes you have an author who repeats himself and he says like as I said earlier but the repetition includes a modification of of what was said earlier so if you're reading carefully you see that he said one thing first and then something else later and you're supposed to notice that if you're the right type of reader and you're not supposed to notice that if you're the wrong type of reader in other words it protects the opinions that are necessary for the community and it also subjects them to questioning for the puppies of the philosophical race, as he put it somewhere, for the for the young men who love to think. That is fascinating. That uh, with that context, reading Bronze Age Mindset by Bronze Age Pervert. I don't know if you've read that. Uh, that really puts that book into context because he, I know he's uh, probably say Straussian, uh, and I know that he certainly has studied the ancient text quite a bit. But the writing style, there was definitely more than one audience uh, in in the in the in the way he was writing it, and some of it was intended to push people away. And some of, and the rest of it was the sort of hidden messages for the people who were really thinking about it and paying attention to it. Um, can you recommend any books by uh, by Strauss here that that actually speaks to this sort of technique? Because uh, I'd like to check that out personally. The source book is called Persecution and the Art of Writing, and mm-hmm. that's where he says in general why this type of writing was needed, why it's a problem, and why it hasn't been noticed until he basically put a light on it. And then he also has a few studies there of medieval thinkers where he tries to show 
you uh, how they did this and how to read them if you read them with this in mind. But persecution in the art of writing is the main text for that. All right, I'm going to have to add it to my to my never-ending pile of books. To yeah, you know, it's actually, um, I, I heard you mention on another conversation that people are studying and you're studying Aristotle or maybe people that in the circles that you are with, you know, they might look at Plato or something like that. And Strauss's view, which is very important for us if we're trying to gain an understanding of these thinkers, is that it's not just the medievals who were in a context of a religious community, but it's also... More generally, any philosopher always is threatened by the city and a threat to the city. And therefore, it's all, always going to be characteristic of philosophy, to, of self-understanding philosophy, to write in this careful way. So one of his great discoveries, I think, is that he provided new access even to Plato and Aristotle by saying, hey, you have rushed so far in your interpretation here with modern suppositions and with modern assumptions that you missed these beautiful details, these nuances, these tucked away little gardens in the in the texts that you won't see if you don't read them, knowing that Plato may have used these methods himself and why he may have. After all, the love of Plato's life, Socrates, my man in that sense, okay, are... Uh, <laughs> The, lo the love of Plato's life was killed by the city for corrupting the youth and for not believing in the gods of the city. That cannot but have left an effect on Plato's understanding of the civic responsibility of philosophical writing. Mm -hmm. You see? So, in, a, in, a, in other words, Strauss is a great guide to the ancient texts because he understands how they wrote. Yeah. Got it. I love it. I'm going to have to check it out. One of the things, that, aside from the content, uh, the style uh, in Aristotle that I've been reading recently... Uh, so dismissive and just kind of curt and funny. And it, it's, it strikes me, I can see it in Nassim Taleb's all's writing also too. It's just, and enough with that argument. Like it just, it's so dismissive and it's just like, it's, it's subtle. And you can just see somebody being disgusted and waving their hand and be like, ah, and enough with that and on to the next one. Uh, but uh, I appreciate that. I'm going to take a look at that. All right. So now I want to move into, let's, I'm going to sort of give you a chance to take this in the direction of where, how you think we should uh, couch this conversation. Let's just assume that uh, I don't know anything about Alexander Dugan. I've heard, uh, you know, he's a uh, Putin's Rasputin. He's the, the man behind the man uh, and that he is driving this new political vision uh, and, and the geopolitical vision uh, for Russia in the 21st century. That's all I know. Okay. I want to know what that means. What is he thinking? Is it real? What influence does he have? Who was he influenced by? Is he relate, related to a Nazi? Heidegger Heidegger is a Nazi, right? Like for real, uh, but uh, not in a bad sense. I don't know. I don't know any of these things. These are the things I want to learn. These are the conversations that I want to have. And, uh, you know, I want to sort of just open it up. Now that we have this context, we know that you're here for the pursuit of knowledge and, and for understanding for the sake of, uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're both sort of renegades out there. So let's have, let's have this conversation and, uh, take, walk me through it. This is Dugan for dummies on Jack Murphy live with Michael Millerland. Let's Millerman. Let's, let's do it, buddy. So I would say that for the circles that you're in, that I'm in that, uh, you know, Claremont American mind, whoever's thinking about somehow maybe has heard something about, you know, even if they don't know the names, they've heard it loosely. I think the starting point is this idea, the place where I started, of the fourth political theory. Mm -hmm. It's the name of the first book of his that was published in English, and it's something that he himself uh, saw and sees as the cutting edge of his thought as a political theorist. And so I think it's a good place to start. All right. The basic idea of the fourth political theory is as follows. The 20th century was a struggle of ideologies, liberalism, mm -hmm. communism, and fascism. He calls those the first, second, and third political theories. And it includes also their variants, okay? Shades of liberalism, shades of communism, and shades of fascism. By the end of the 20th century, liberalism was the last ideology standing. Some people declared that moment a uh, liberal triumphalism. They said this, and, right? Yeah, the end of history, exactly. right? The basic idea yeah. that we have come to the last, if history is the history of philosophical ideas, and here you, philosophy, we have the last great philosophical idea, human rights, universal freedom, the state that guarantees individual rights and freedoms, all of that, liberalism was seen as it had its triumphalist moment. 
However, he says, what if you reject communism, which you do, he does, fascism, which he says is to, to be rejected, but also liberalism? Well, here you're not really left at first with any obvious alternative because those three exhausted the ideological space in the 20th century. And by the time liberalism came out victorious, there wasn't a coherent ideological alternative. Now people start to talk populism, this, that, but strictly speaking, there was no obvious theoretical alternative. So he says, this is the initial gesture or mo logical moment of the, of the fourth political theory. If we reject all three of liberalism, communism, and fascism, and we don't want to get caught up in the trap of believing they're exhaustive, that they exhaust all the alternatives, we should declare the space of a fourth political theory. And just that first declaration, the naming, the carving out of a contextual space for thinking, already gives you a breath of fresh air from what is on the other side of it, right? From having to choose between those three. And I just want to give an aside here, okay? Because one of the reasons this resonated with me personally when I was at University of British Columbia back in the day is I was reading Strauss and I had an interest in Israel, okay, the state of Israel. And I noticed that all of these things were immediately called fascist. This logic still happens every day today, not just with Strauss, not just with Israel, but with a million other phenomena. They're called fascist. And if you look at it, you see the logic. If you're not a liberal and you're not to the left of liberal, there's nothing else you could be conceptually but fascist in that model. And therefore, it, you sort of understand why everybody lumps you together with that title. But the problem is that those three do not exhaust the options, right? They don't exhaust the possibilities. So he declares the space of a fourth political theory. That's already an accomplishment. He says in his book that I don't understand why people who don't hear about the fourth, who hear about the fourth political theory don't open a bottle of champagne and celebrate that now they can think freely outside of liberalism, communism, and fascism. But then you get to the next step and you say, okay, well, all right, you've cleared a space that is, says what it's not. Can you say anything about what it is or what its positive components might be? And here his analysis is something as... Yeah, so let's... Can I stop you yeah. there? So uh, you said uh, positive components de de defined as what it's not. Uh, uh, no, sorry, let me it... clarify. So the negative is we're not going to be the first, second, or third political theory. That creates the space right. for thinking. But then you could right. say, well, what is going to be in that space? And he does have right. something to say about that like as, a, as an option. So that's what right. I was going to continue to But if you're saying it's... it's it's Does it reject all the tenets of liberalism or is it just saying this is not like a holistic adoption of liberalism like can is it saying like individual rights bad uh here's how he puts it oh i'm going to give you my image for it so imagine that each of these liberalism communism fascism is like a house of cards okay so it has components but it's a whole thing so he says you can perform the following operation you can break the house of cards in other words break the holism as you said of this system as an ideology and now you're left with just its component pieces that have been to sh switch metaphors their ideological charge has now been like removed from them you see they've been de-ideologized and just become components you see mm. so he says what we could do is we can perform this operation we can dismantle the conceptual schema or house of cards of each of these systems and then look to see what of the pieces that are left over can be used, used in thinking about our alternatives. So here's how he says that should be done. He says, in each case, how do you make the house of cards fall? He says, you have to reject some key component of each theory. And when you reject that component, it will no longer be an ideological whole. And when it's no longer an ideological whole, you can pick from it. So in liberalism, he totally rejects the idea of the individual. He says, you don't have liberalism without the idea of the individual. So I'm going to reject the idea of the individual. And from liberalism, I can borrow its emphasis on, or what's useful in the construction of a fourth political theory is the emphasis on freedom. But what's anathema is the definition of the human being as an individual. And also the notion of progress. So he says, same thing in communism, what we're going to reject is linear temporality, the idea that history progresses to from point A to point Z, where point Z is going to be uh, as it is in that model. We're going to reject the linearity of time. We're also going to reject the class-centric analysis because it's not, he doesn't say class isn't important, but he says class is not all important. So you reject the centrality of class, but he says we're going to adopt as useful and as significant 
it's critique of capitalism. So there, mm -hmm. after all, there are profound insights in, mm -hmm. in um, communist political theory about mm -hmm. the drawbacks of capitalism. And from the third political theory, fascism, which, by the way, I should add, he in the book, he says fascism on one hand and Nazism on the other. He distinguishes them. They're both variants of the third political theory. In Nazism, he rejects the emphasis on race and on supremacy. And mm -hmm. in fascist political theory, he rejects the statism because they're separate things. And fascist political theory, after all, is just uh, to distort slightly. Yeah. It's like a deification of the state. So he says, we're going to reject all of that. But what can we borrow? So if we borrow freedom from liberalism as you know, an important category, we borrow the critique of capitalism from communism. What could possibly be a value in the third political theory, if, especially if you've rejected you know, race and supremacy and statism? So he says that you can borrow the notion of the ethnos. Now, the ethnos is not the race, and Dugan has a textbook on ethnosociology, which I translated. It's available in English. And you get there an understanding of what he means, including his rejection of racism, what he means, what schools of thought he's drawing on, and why the ethnos might be important. And he says liberalism and communism, they totally erased the idea of the ethnos of, let's say, of the of what's studied in cultural anthropology he said they they didn't really have space for that and could you can you define it for me well basically it's a study of it's a study of societies from their simplest to their most complex but it doesn't interpret the, the society as a result of abstract individuals coming together it interprets society as a result of a shared community of language and belief that shares a view of its own origin now, he says that it's not a question of whether that belief is or isn't accurate because we're not dealing with the genetics. We're not dealing with race. We're not dealing even with uh, natural science. We're dealing with cultural anthropology, with social science, with the logic of belief and with the structures of society. So in his ethnosociology book, let me just say briefly, he goes from yeah. the simplest, which he calls the ethnos, to another model, which he calls in Russian the narod. You could say it's sort of like the folk or the people, but not a people like an agglomeration of individuals, the people where you say like German people or Spanish people, okay? So you have the ethnos, you have the multi-ethnic folk, then you have the nation, like the nation state, civil society, global society, and post society. So it's a whole model of social um, structures and complexity. And for example, social stratification, the figure of the shaman, the figure of the philosopher, the, fi the figure of the you know bourgeoisie. So it's actually a whole analysis. But he says there's no room for that really in these other models. And there were thinkers who were somehow within, they weren't liberals, they weren't communists, they're called conservative revolutionary thinkers. There were sort of like internal dissidents against the Nazi regime to a certain extent, or take Julius Evola, he criticized Italian fascism, but from the right. So these are all figures that are important for Dugan. And he says, look, that's just something that we can draw on, not to necessarily reproduce it one for one, but it's a theoretical, useful theoretical resource for the reconstruction or new construction of a political alternative. So that's one of the things that the fourth political theory is. And he says, actually, this, li this liberates us from his point of view to study. Like, if you know I am not third political theory, second political theory, or first political theory, you can then study the resources of those thinkers without feeling like you're identifying with the total ideology. So there may be something valuable in Derrida in Deleuze or in somebody else where you take those aspects of thought without buying the whole ideology. So somehow his method is to free up the serious reconsideration of all of these ideological alternatives, not to reproduce them, but to borrow and somehow be inspired by if need be. I have many questions. <laughs> uh, the first question that comes to mind is, what does it mean to reject the individual but embrace freedom? Who's freedom, if not the individuals? So great question, very natural question to ask. So his view is that I think the simplest way to, to see what he means is that there's more to being a human being than being an individual. Individual is an interpretation of a more basic experience called being human. And the concept of individual is already somehow a constraining over interpretation of this broader experience of being human that doesn't exhaust 
what it means to be human. It actually limits it. It could be, it's a useful limitation in some ways. It produces certain results, not all of which are a problem, but it somehow blocks genuine access to what it means to be human. And I should add that Strauss, uh, sorry, Dugan says that's true of identification of us as class consciousness, as well as identification of us as race or as status. He says all of those interpretations of human existence are misleading. They're all, they miss the mark and they obscure the phenomena. So one of the key components, and this is where we open the door to Heidegger and things get uh, even more philosophical than they have been up to this point of the analysis. He says, okay, if we're going to reject the individual, we're going to reject the class, we're going to reject the race, and we're going to reject the state, what will be at the center of the fourth political theory? And he says, it's going to be the, it's going to be what Heidegger calls in his works Dasein. In other words, the most basic human existence that hasn't yet been obscured by self-interpretation. You see? Mm -hmm. And he says, if we take Dasein as the fourth political, as the actor or agent or center of the fourth political theory, we now have access to the whole philosophical apparatus, methodology, terminology, and everything that Heidegger puts on the table without falling into any one of the three political theories. Because although it's true that Heidegger was a member of the Nazi party, it's not true that his philosophy is properly characterized as a Nazi philosophy. And for those people who may be listening who don't buy it, I appeal to the authority of Strauss, who said that it's not enough to understand Heidegger's thought, the fact that he was a Nazi. But we don't need to appeal to Strauss's authority. You can look at Heidegger's own writing or take my word for it. Uh, <laughs> so Dugan says, you if you put Dasein, or as I say, this uh, our human being that hasn't been constrained yet in its self-interpretation, at the center of the political theory, there's a notion of freedom there that is not reducible to or identical with the liberal understanding of freedom. You see? And it's not, there's no expectation that we know what that means right away, right? I mean, after all, he had to write books on Heidegger and develop this idea. And But one of the beautiful things, for example, he has a book uh, where one of the titles is Experiments in Existential Politics. Because this hasn't really been done before in this way. But he's saying if we want an alternative to the status quo, we're going to have to rethink some things from a new perspective. We don't just want to recycle liberalism versus leftism, leftism versus Nazism, Nazism versus liberalism. He's like, stop that and let's go deeper or let's go up or let's go around. Let's find a new ground, a new foundation, a new top topology or topography. And Heidegger is at the center of that for him. <clears throat> and uh, this most basic human existence that hasn't been limited by self-interpretation um is it even possible to acknowledge or understand that that state of being uh, given that in order to even acknowledge it you have to implore some uh, level of self-interpretation or analysis yeah so it is but it's a return because we always find ourselves already in a mode of self-interpretation right we we're never encountering ourselves or the world or anybody else uninterpreted so we're already in a set of interpretations that's fine heidegger acknowledges that he has to because it's it's the fact but mm -hmm. the question is can you return from the understanding of that fact or from the observation of that fact to can you sort of turn your attention to your to the act of interpretation and to the fact that you're a self-interpreting being and that gets the ball rolling so heidegger acknowledges the circularity here you can never get outside of interpretation but you can sort of, as he, as he puts, the point is not to get outside of the circle, but to get into it in the right way, to see how it's operating and to move from how we normally are, namely assuming that we already know what's what, not taking our interpretations for granted or interpreting, but without a clear understanding of how we're doing that or, or what or in what terms and returning to ourselves in our basic constitution and ground. That's Heidegger largely. I mean, the, his 1927 book, Being in Time, is, that re, is an, an attempt to effect that return of our thinking and our attunement to the being that we are, a return from our normal everyday experience of ourselves and others. And so it's very much of a reorientation, um, but it's definitely not a black box. It's not an unattainable, you're not trying to get to a perspective that is outside of everywhere. Quite to the contrary, 
he says you can't do that and scientific modern scientific philosophy and other movements that that claim they can get to a perspective that's not anywhere are an example of misinter of very bad self misinterpretation you see mm -hmm. so it yeah. avoids both like cultural relativism on one hand and strict scientific objectivism on the other and it avoids them by going deeper to a deeper foundation so heidegger is a uh, a revelation in that sense okay um I'm, I'm i'm putting my brain to this as best i can there's so so many questions so in summary dugan rejected out of liberalism communism fascism slash nazism one the, the individual two linear temporality and the class-centric analysis that means like uh capitalism necessarily leads to communism etc and that uh in communism there's the focus on the the, the uh, property owners and the workers and that's sort of the fundamental basis for for uh, the way the entire society is founded that's very marxist thought right um and then also rejected the emphasis on race and statism from fascism and nazism accepted from liberalism is a sense of freedom uh is uh also from communism accepted a critique of capitalism so that begs a, it begs a question is that the right thing it brings up the question what would be in its place uh, and then third accepts from fascism or nazism this idea of ethnos which is not race but a sh I wrote down a shared imagined order. Does that sound, does that sound right? Yeah, it does. Okay, shared imagined order. To me, that sounds like Hariri and uh, the book Sapiens that I read a few years ago uh, about us organizing around imagined stories, right? That's the way that we gather. Um, it struck me, is that when people say civic nationalism, is that similar in, do you think? Is, is a civic nationalism, like what people would purport that we have in the United States, uh, not based on race, some people would say, not based on race, but based around an idea and concepts. Uh, is that, would that fall within this ethnos idea? Yeah, and du no, well, in Dugan's model, it's a form of society, civic nationalism in the society that sees itself as, in, as based around an idea or comprised of individuals related in such and such a way. Um, but what he says is that in all of these social organizations, from the simplest to the most complex, so for example, you can say even beyond the American idea, you have the idea of global citizenship, right? Where you no longer are, it's not civic nationalism, it's like uh, gl global identity, right? Globalism. And beyond globalism, you have the identity that rejects even human identity and begins to say po a post-human post-social order where no what matters is what we have in common with all sentient beings or maybe at some point with just all life period right so in that mm -hmm. total model he sees civic nationalism as one among a number of alternatives but the crucial thing is that in no case is the smaller shared ethnic identity erased it's only pushed deeper and deeper down in the basic um fraction you know so it's like that it's always there ethnic identity is the simplest identity even in a complex society so it's again he has a model on it it's hard to necessarily to walk through it in detail but he definitely has an account of civic identity and of the shared national idea as opposed to like a nar more narrow tribal order or the globalist alternative that's all in his uh in his work got it okay so i'm starting to see the picture here and so we've rejected some things we've accepted some things and now we're starting to put some things into the box and one of them was this uh the idea and i, I didn't get the, the exact name but it came from heidegger about the most basic human existence uh that has been limited in the past by self-interpretation that's right das sein. is d-a-s-e-i-n all right das sein. okay so now we've added that what else are we adding oh, to the mix okay so at one point dugan says the following that the fourth political theory has you could see it as having like a body soul and spirit which correspond to the following disciplines the body is geopolitics the soul is ethnosociology which we discussed briefly the spirit is theology and the deepest center is heidegger so this is just another way of seeing it it's a total uh it's not just a, a philosophical model it's also a worldview that tries to reconfigure the disciplines like the scientific disciplines so let me tell you what i mean he says in our prevailing model the the number one disciplines are economics and law liberalism is fundamentally economics and law so the rejection of liberalism would be something else it wouldn't just be another form of economics and law 
it has a totally different constitution of the sciences and geopolitics becomes an important component of that for him now there's a, another big discussion here but he put his money where his mouth is in the russian context and made geopolitics a thing in russia he's, you could say he established a russian school of geopolitics he had a he had a great influence as i understand in military circles after the collapse of the soviet union because they found themselves first of all really without a clear uh, without a clear enemy without a clear identity without a clear self-understanding and he drew on the resources of classical geopolitical thinkers who see the division between land power and sea power and some other components like this and he began teaching courses on geopolitics and later his geopolitical a textbook became assigned reading and geopolitics became a discipline in russia where you could see that nato the logic of like american western nato activity and the meaning of the russian opposition to that so that's some some of that was known about dugan when i started my work that he's a geopolitical thinker because some of his main you know reputation and works had to do with that for example the infamous book foundations of geopolitics um but almost nobody really knew these other aspects of his thought even though they were available but just nobody seemed to have paid much attention to them so you have the geopolitical level of analysis you have the ethno-sociological level that's sort of where you're talking about like he's got this view that in liberalism there's civilization and the uncivilized or like the civilized the savage and the barbaric so there's civilization is one standard like you're civilized or you know you're not you're developed or you're underdeveloped it's sort of just one thing civilization it's a state that you attain but his view drawing on some of his predecessors was that there's many civilizations that civilization is plural you can't reduce every group's experience if it, if indian islamic african so on and so on this whole register of civilizations you can't just map it onto the self-understanding of the west so partially that level of analysis that's the ethno-sociological level so geopolitics um, civilizational studies or ethnosociology and then theology this is all this is the thought about the gods about the divine about the sacred about revelation about eschatology the end of times the beginning of times uh, and he says again this is part of his um disciplinary worldview like he says theology should be a hundred times more important than economics and uh and law you see as should these mm -hmm. other disciplines but heidegger is the is the center of all of this because after all dugin i say my characterization not too misleading i believe he's a philosophical supremacist okay not only dugin i think strauss and heidegger are also philosophical supremacists and it's interesting to wonder how you can be a philosophical supremacist and still have these very divergent positions but for dugin the philosophy is the highest human activity and the philosopher is in a way the highest human type so he couldn't leave it at geopolitics ethnosociology and theology so therefore heidegger is the radical center of all of that and somehow he tries to correlate geopolitics to heidegger's thinking you know cultural civilizational studies to the resources of heideggerian philosophy and likewise with the theology and he he's got a lot of books on on these i've, I've taught some of them i've read some of them not all of them tra and translated this is a massive project of political philosophy designed to present a well-grounded well-articulated genuine alternative to the ideologies of the 20th century not some marginal um not some marginal leftist circus anti-globalism something rooted founded justified in touch with the greatest thinkers that we know and with the most deepest dis disciplinary contributions that people have made and it's this massive project needless to say he doesn't do it all by himself he leads seminars he has other people who contribute to this project he himself calls it sort of an open undertaking he's written that he doesn't want it to become a closed dogma because it's got to live with the openness of das with freedom dasein's freedom as soon as it becomes a closed ideology that's all dead he knows that it can become a parody of itself in a simulacrum he says that but it's a risk that you take when you think gen genuinely you know that that somebody else takes it and makes it into a cheap uh parody of itself or some you know knots bowl meme or something but his view of it i think is a serious top to bottom rigorous tremendous monumental project of political philosophy that passes through the almost universally acknowledged giant of 20th century thought heidegger 
So it's the real deal from that perspective, in my view, which doesn't mean we have to buy every part of it or agree with every step in the reasoning, but it's definitely not reducible to Dugan is this or Dugan is that. He talked to Alex Jones, therefore I won't read his book. He's got a big beard and looks like Rasputin, therefore he's trying to infiltrate our institutions. It's something else. Um, and those are some of its components. <clears throat> the historical context for this, is it possible that this is a, a wounded intellect? So the end of the 20th century, it is the end of history, people say, right? Liberalism tri you know, triumphed over everything. Communism failed. Fascism, Nazism was defeated. And you're living in Russia, who's not a liberal society. I think you're either faced with accepting liberalism as your dominating you know, ideas of, of culture and society or left trying to come up with something else. So is this, this is like a reaction to communism's loss in the competitive world of ideologies in the 20th century? No? Uh, yes and no. So no, because there were alternatives. There were other parties at the time that were not liberal, uh, like in movements and things like that, radical nationalists and others. But actually, it's a total, it is wounded intellect in the sense that he looked at the Soviet society, he looked at the Soviet ideology, he looked at around even in the 90s to see some of the alternatives, and all of it became sort of uh, bankrupt for him. But here's the question, what happens existentially to us when we have a wounded intellect that's wounded so deeply that basically it stands naked before itself for the first time. When it looks around and all the scales have fallen from its eyes or when it's become deeply disillusioned. So the fact, if we say, if we interpret his experience as a wounded intellect, we say that's actually the moment when, in a sense, it's the moment when you can see most clearly and when you can see most mm -hmm. profoundly, when you have that, when suddenly everything that you're familiar with and everything that you've taken for granted has lost its meaning for you. Heidegger analyzes that. He says when we're usually in the world with things, with beings, drinking coffee, doing this, doing that. But at some point we enter this exit. We, ha we can have this existential moment where everything has become meaningless for us. And that throws us back on ourselves and actually gives us access to ourselves for the first time in a genuine way. So I would say in a sense, and he, he doesn't say wounded intellect, but he has an account uh, in some of his books of, of a moment just like this, where he discovered the sort of like the meaninglessness or emptiness of the moment. But some people discover it and they go to the bottle or something like that. But he discovered it and it was sort of like an initiate, like sort of like a mystical, magical initiation into a whole world of undiscovered alternatives. So it is a crucial moment for him, but just it's not like, you know, my country lost and I need to come up with an alternative. I somehow, you know, want to regain stature in the world. I mean, he says in some of his books, he's very critical at times of Russian conservatives, not liberals, and of Russian nationalists when he says, you guys are putting forward alternatives with no self-understanding, no philosophical grounding. You have no clue what you're talking about. You don't know what it means to be Russian because you've never thought about what it means to be. And so he's not just running to any alternative. He actually had this ground come out from under his feet. He landed somewhere and from that somewhere is now somehow rebuilding and, re and everything takes on a different hue from that perspective. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the whole phenomenon, and again, this is not going to be maybe fully comprehensible at first pass, but what the intellect itself is, when you say wounded intellect, right? The whole question of what the in intellect is, what is our intellect? What does it mean to think? That for him is a question of the first priority. In fact, he's doing a series of lecture courses now on YouTube where he just, the most recent one he just finished, this is on Heidegger's reading of Aristotle and on the tradition of phenomenology from Brentano, Husserl, and Heidegger. He just did a lecture on the intellect, the active intellect in Aristotle and its phenomenological meaning. And I'm going to tell you, only someone who has had the type of uh, illuminatory experience that he has had could convey this topic in such a profound and moving way. So the my... In a way, my defense of Dugan over the years, it just, among other things, because it's there's, yes, there's the know your enemy type reasoning. Yes, there's the, I always thought, how can we have anybody in our government working on Russia who doesn't actually study Russian thinkers? That's like, 
just doesn't make any sense to me. You want to study their ideologues. That's obvious. There's nothing more to talk about. I, I guess that's not, right. not everybody sees it that way. <laughs> but even separately from all of that, even separately from like, oh, he's an interesting political theorist. Um, at, on the philosophical level, there is something that he ha that he's conveying that is just um, very worthwhile, inherently valuable. I can relate 100% to having a moment of existential crisis. I can relate 100% to having everything that you thought was important sort of torn down in front of you and giving you that opportunity to reflect and look deeply uh, inwards uh, and, and, and taking advantage of an opportunity to rebuild something that seems to make more sense than the thing uh, that you lost did. Um, one of the questions I'm struck with right now is, and maybe I'm totally wrong about this, about liberalism. Liberalism to me is like a process, not an end goal. Um, whereas I kind of felt like communism and, and, and fascism, Nazism is, is an end goal rather than a process. Liberalism seemed to be a system to find to truth. Um, whereas communism told you what the truth was, uh, is, is, and maybe I'm wrong in that, but is the fourth, uh, this fourth political theory, is this a, is this a system for finding truth, uh, or is it the truth? Uh, and is that a meaningful difference? Is that a distinction worth, uh, identifying or, you know, I don't even know. I'm out of my element here. This is the Dugan for dummies. Mm -hmm. I'm asking questions. Let's, let's see where they go. Yeah. So there are a set of basic, you could say there's a basic set of shared beliefs or of dogmas that a simple adherent of the fourth political theory would have so in that sense it's like you know you think there's not not just one civilization but many civilizations that you reject the superiority of of uh, natural scientific thinking to other ways of thinking okay you accept the relevance of divinity in human life okay uh and and so on so these are somehow shared elements. They have their philosophical counterpart or their theoretical counterpart where you get into the details and there are open questions and it can be more experimental. But I'm saying for the average, um, you know, person who just it, imagine someone is just in, living in Dugan's. If there's a state that adopts this as an ideology, not everybody is going to go around talking about Heidegger, just like not everybody goes around talking about Hobbes and Machiavelli and Locke, right? It's a relatively small group that digs into the theoretical foundations. So mm -hmm. it has its dogmas in that sense, but it's meant to be fundamentally concerned with truth. It's not a, like there are political theories today in the US and elsewhere that are premised on the rejection that truth exists at all, right? They say there is right. no truth. There's nothing to attain to. There's basically what we agree to. And you talked about this, I think, uh, in your last episode on postmodernism to a certain extent, right? I had the pleasure, a good discussion there. So this idea oh, that you, you can reject, um, just truth doesn't exist. It's whatever we agree to. It's whatever we, it's power relations or something. That's, that is not, power. that is not Dugan's view. Incidentally, also not, not Strauss's view, not Heidegger's view. Um, but it's a trickier question in each case, what truth means for them. So one of the things Heidegger is, is, uh, known for, or one of the things that he made central to his questioning is what is truth what is the essence of truth what 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 is what is truth and so he said we commonly take it as the correspondence of what we say with something in the world so if if i say um my coffee is warm and my coffee is warm so my sentence corresponds to the object and therefore the sentence is true so truth is like a property of sentences that do or don't match external reality. That's one way of looking at what truth is, okay? He thought, did not think that that was fundamental. He thought that that was derivative. He doesn't say that is not, no, you know, if, I, there's, if it's not true that my coffee is hot or cold, no, that's not what he says, but he says that's not the fundamental experience of truth or what it means. So he's got a lecture course called On the Essence of Truth where he says, look, you talk about a true friend or you talk about, uh, you know, true, let's say, uh, true gold or something like that. Okay, authentic, truth, true in the sense of real or authentic. But what do we mean by real? So the whole question of what is an object? What is reality? How do we correlate language to what exists? And what is even the act of judgment? All of that, again, it's a philosophical level, but there's no getting around it because when we begin to ask what, is, what does it mean for something to be true, we're not going to answer that in any really in any other way, right? Besides looking at the opinions that people have, eventually we got to 
scratch down beneath the surface. So he's, he, Heidegger had a more basic, I mean, a more fundamental understanding of truth that Dugan takes over. And I won't go into all of the details of it, but it's neither the postmodern rejection of there being anything that you can say. It's not a total anti-reality in that sense, but it's also not limited to the correct description of objective reality. It's, it is something different but it's not anti-truth, mm. it's not post-truth. It just says there's a more basic notion of truth that we have fallen away from. It's kind of like this. I'll give you an image that may or may not be helpful. Imagine that you have a closed door. On one side of the door is a bright light and we're on the other side, okay? We open the door and the light shines through and then the door begins to close and close and close and close and close until it's shut. Heidegger saw the history of Western philosophy approximately like that. There's one moment where the light comes through very clearly and then the rest of the time, it's somehow being removed from us up to the point where we come to nihilism and to the view that there is no truth and there's just power. That means the door has closed again. The light is on the other side of the door. Okay. So there's not just truth. There's the history of truth. There's the transformation of truth through the eras or through the epochs. There's what truth was when the door first opened with the pre-Platonics. There's truth as it was when the door began to close in Plato. And there's truth when the door is shut and the cameraman has taken the lights and put them back in storage in uh, modern nihilism, you know, modern technological nihilism. So the question is, can we open the door again? And we don't, it's almost like we don't even know what's on the other side of it. Is the light still there? Is something else there? We don't know because it's not been, we don't even know there's a door there anymore. It's been so long since we tried to open it. So the, in some sense, all of these thinkers, their job is to remind us, hey, guys, there's something over there. Let's go have a look. Let's knock. Let's feel it out. If it's locked, let's find the key. As some of them say they opened it, we don't know for sure, right? We got, for now, we have to walk. For now, we don't even know there's a door. So truth is something with the history. Truth is something that has a development. But what, what does that even mean? So this is all in undiscovered, uncharted territory, I think. You know, it's, uh, hmm. But it's, in my view, it's where eventually thoughtful figures will need to turn because the question of human being of being of truth of history all of this is at this is somehow whether we know it or not at the center of the ground that's shaking beneath our feet somehow it's almost like there's a knock from the other side of the door you know and it's saying hey you forgot about me and i'm not saying it's god that's over interpreting all that we know is there's something calling us to see that the light has gone out. And to me, that's the whole drama and the whole mystery of where things stand right now. Dugan falls in there, Heidegger, Strauss, they all sense it. And there you go. That's why that's the sort of the truth, um, the issue or problem of truth. It's, a, it's sort of a mystery, not just something we either reject or assert. <clears throat> that's hard to follow up, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um yes all of that uh as i'm taking notes i'm struck with the question you said that the fourth political theory has as an underlying assumption or a belief that there are many civilizations does that make it like a civilizational pluralist uh it believes that there are a multiple civilizations of equal worth and and value uh, or is there one civilization or type of civilization that is preferred or better? What, what does that Dugan's mean? Dugan's view is that there's a plurality of civilizations. So that's number one. There's a plurality of civilizations. And in each civilization, there's going to be a few different basic types of thought, roughly like a materialistic type of thought that rejects everything except for what you can see, touch, feel, smell, and e eat taste uh there's going to be something like a um vertical topography where you want to go up so in each in each civilization there's going to be some form of like the mystic or prophet or philosopher someone who tries to ascend beyond to a to a more real world to the ideas or to the you know what i mean to break through somehow to a deeper reality and in each culture or civilization, there's going to be something like a middle ground and all of their variations. So he's done actually an analysis of, uh, he's got a 24 volume book of philosophical analysis of civilizational plurality based on these philosophical methods. So as I say, 
No, I don't recommend, you know, I'm not saying anybody should go and uh, work through all 24 volumes. They're not even in English yet. But yeah, so many civilizations. And in no case can you assume that you've really understood them from your own point of view. So basically, he's saying, look, let's take a basic example. If a Russian person wants to know the West, he can't just assume the West is worse than Russia or the West is better than Russia or the West is equivalent to Madonna and McDonald's or whatever. You know, back in the 90s, maybe that reference is more appropriate. It's like you actually have to go and study the poets and the philosophers and the, and, and the, and the writers. And you have in sort of in that case, you'll get to know the American cultural soul, so to speak. And same thing, if you want to go study some um, Spain or Brazil, and all, all of these are multifaceted. I said in my interview back in the day, one of the phrases that got me in trouble, but it's as true today as it was then, it, he's pointing to a blossoming complexity of human existence. So, so cultural and civilizational multipolarity, it reflects the blossoming complexity of human existence. It's, it's languages, it's songs, it's dances, and also, as I say, the deeper dimension, how it, how it thinks about time, how it thinks about God, how it thinks about history, how it thinks about truth. And he says we shouldn't reduce, we shouldn't take any one of them as the standard for all the others of them. It doesn't mean that somebody who's just, uh, like, let me give you this example from Strauss. So Strauss said culture used to mean cultivation, like the cultivation of nature. I have a garden, I have some flowers, I'm cultivating them so that they grow. But people have started to talk about culture, like there's a culture of prisoners, there's a culture of gangs, there's a culture of rapists. So culture got away from the sense of the cultivation of human nature and started to mean just any set of ordered activity. And uh, Strauss's view was like, now it's kind of like we've littered our garden with cigarette butts and, you know, peed, pissed on it and we don't even care. So we've moved away from the actual notion of genuine cultivation. So Dugan's view is not that you know, the cigarette butts and the public urination is as equally worthy as the philosophical life or, or of poetry. It's just that there are many gardens and there are many flowers that are growing in those gardens. And that's where he wants to turn his attention and his, he, he thinks that should be reflected politically to a certain extent in a multipolar world and philosophically by, you know, the correct study of the alternatives. So this is a great point, uh, something to really talk about. One is, uh, it, does, liberal, uh, does liberalism account for uh, civilizational plurality, one? And then two, uh, does it account for a multipolar world that reflects these uh, civilizational pol polarities? And three, to what extent is this notion of multipolarity civilizationally really feeding the geopolitical view and I think is what's really getting in people's uh, you know, the burr in people's saddle when they start hearing about multipolar world, because uh, from the United States perspective, that's not exactly what we have or what we want or what we see for the future, right? Yeah. So generally speaking, liberal uh, political doctrine or liberal political philosophy or just liberal thinking doesn't really acknowledge plurality, cultural civilizational plurality in a meaningful, you know, in an adequate way. So it's not just that it denies the worth and value, the unique worth and value, you know, of other cultures and civilizations, it recognizes them the same way it recognizes the individual dignity of individuals, but it doesn't recognize them in their own self-understanding, self-interpretation, and self-estimation, I would say. That's its uh, rejection of plurality in space, but it also in a way rejects, I mean, this is a sort of Strauss's point to a certain extent, that the liberal mind also doesn't grant it's also very high-minded and, um, how would you put it, demeaning of previous times. So it also looks at past times as not really worth. They're just, you know, they're pre-modern. They just are not yet what we are now and therefore are not really worth our full attention. That's the temporal aspect. Or they're underdeveloped. You know, they just haven't gotten as far today, you know, here and now as we are here and now. So the, it takes itself as the standard in space and in time. So in that sense, liberal world is not really pluralistic in the deep sense of acknowledging the worth uh, and uniqueness of the of the other cultures and civilizations. It also, accordingly, you know, doesn't really respect a multipolar world. So Dugan had to an, uh, analyze this and he says the West can do like multilateral approaches where other governments together with the United States 
will pursue a certain policy. So it can work together with other states, other blocks, and other forces, but without really caring about or um, you know cherishing their c distinct cultural identity. And also, obviously, any power wants to preserve its power and sees the rise of other powers as a threat and as a problem. Whether you dress it up as blossoming complexity or not, it doesn't matter, right? You don't <laughs> want to give up your hegemony. You don't want to give up your power. You don't want to cede the momentum. All of that is totally understandable, obviously, and is uh, justified to a certain extent and also well defended by other political theorists in our tradition. Um, but still, you asked, right, does the liberal world sort of have an embrace of multipolarity? The answer is no, although to a certain extent with Trump, that uh, that changed to a certain extent. He gave speeches. Now, this is not my main area of expertise, but he gave speeches in defense of national self-determination and cultural self-determination in Poland and elsewhere. And there were figures like Ernesto Arujo, if I said that correctly, in Brazil, who took that and, and wrote about it and made a big deal out of it. Uh, so that marked a break, you know, with the past approaches. But definitely, um, it's not inherent to liberalism in the way that it is to, let's say, Eurasianism, to give a name to Dugan's ideology in its Russian uh, outfit, uh, to acknowledge these differences. So multipolarity is kind of like an official doctrine for Russia. There shouldn't be just one pole in the world. But again, that's obvious enough, right? We don't want the United States to be the sole dominating force in the world. And on the other hand, for the, from the United States, not to want there to be other competitors. So all of that is very natural. But still, it, you have to raise the question, on what basis is there going to be the assertion of multipolarity? Is it just a power struggle? Does it reflect something else, right? Is the theory just a dressing of the power games? Or do the power problems arise because they grow out of the theoretical problems? You know, So there's a bit of both of that, I would say. But if Dugan didn't have volume after volume after volume of genuinely theoretical philosophical work, it'd be very easy to say these are all just power games. But mm. uh, more often than not, the, the thinking comes first, and then the power relations arise from within what has been configured in thought. You see, so if you go to Heidegger and if you combine them with these other things and you have cultural uniqueness and distinction, then you have this whole question of multipolarity. So Dugan's been fighting for it politically by trying to make a blo various blocks and geopolitical uh, allies for Russia. He's been trying to do it domestically and in international politics. But again, I argue that that reflects his deeper world worldview. It's like the, again, the geopolitics in his model on his own account for what it's worth. We don't have to accept it, but on his own account, we shall at least take it uh, as a starting point. Geopolitics is the body right, of, is the body of the discipline, ethnosociology, the soul, theology, the spirit, and Heidegger, the center of all of these things. So in a way, it's not that the body is not important, but the body is just one component. And it's not like the body is more important than the soul. You know, if anything, the soul is more important than the body. So there's a geopolitics, there is a defense of multipolarity, but it's supposed to reflect what he thinks is the truth about civilizational plurality. Russia is a really big place, right? And uh, Soviet Union spanned a number of different uh, areas, Europe, uh, Asia. I remember in college, I used to date girls, the Russian girls, and some would look some way, some would look another way. Then I dated a Kazakh girl. You know, there's like a whole tremendous variety of people that were within the, the Soviet bloc and, and living within Russia. Russia's a massive place, right? It's both Europe, it's both Asia. To what extent is uh, is that that experience bubbling up through these ideas, right? Because it has to sort of, if it doesn't take into account the natural phenomenon of multi-ethnic in a way and, and multipolar world, then it's sort of dis discounting its own existence and its own history. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So there's the experience of, uh, mul of the many groups. There's also the experience of having lived in the so Soviet Union. So you have the idea not just of non-politically organized groups, but also of politically organized groups and of a union or an empire that embraces them all, as well as the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union into the Russian Federation as a smaller and distinct form of government. So all of that is there for Dugan and his thinking about political life and political reality, no doubt. And it's easier for him to put his finger on these types of things than it is in a just a stable, long-lasting 
civic nationalist country where you haven't had moments of crisis. You haven't had the same moments of crisis and the same things coming to the surface, as you said. So for sure, all of that factors into his, uh, into his thinking and into his theorizing. Hmm. Fascinating. One of the second things that I wrote down here was reject natural thinking. What, what did I write that down right? Or is that, could you explain that? This was, this was right after acknowledging many civilizations and right before accepting the divinity of human life in between there was rejecting natural so, thinking. Did I, did I, I get that I must right? have said rejecting the natural science. So the idea that natural, natural science. that scientific study of objective reality is the standard for human knowledge and the height of human perfection that basically our task is not scientific knowledge of reality and that use of what we discover in scientific study of reality the technological implementation of those discoveries for the improvement of our power efficiency comfort levels and all of that that is basically usually considered to be you know mo modern outlook there the scientific conquest of nature as the standard for the relief of man's estate. We live better when we put the products of scientific discovery into practice. But that pri that privileges, in a sense, scientific consciousness over, the, uh, over other experiences and other, again, not, not less intellectual, but not necessarily scientific rationality as a description of objective reality. So I can only say that there was a group of thinkers, Husserl, Heidegger, and others, phenomenological thinkers, who said, we can look at pre-scientific, not primitive culture, society, you know, X amount of years ago, but in us ourselves, what is the pre-scientific mode of our own thinking and consciousness? In what sense is scientific thought a modification of our pre-scientific mode of consciousness? Again, not in time. We're not talking about some cave men here we're saying how is our consciousness itself constituted in relation to scientific knowledge and scientific modes of thinking that school basically was phenomenology it looked at pre-scientific it studied consciousness in ourselves in its pre-scientific form through certain methods that it used to get to that and without again going into all of the details the basic view here is not to take the scientific mind as the peak standard so why why for example is the scientist on the peak of the mountain as the um, perfection of the human intellect and not the poet, you see, or the scientist and not uh, some other form of human intellectual activity. So because I call Dugan a philosophical supremacist, he does take intellect in some sense as supreme, but he doesn't reduce the operation of the intellect to modern scientific rationalism. Neither, by the way, I, I have to emphasize, just for the record, neither, by the way, does Strauss. So Strauss himself also learned from Husserl and Heidegger, also rejected the primacy of scientific knowledge without becoming some anti-scientific postmodern leftist, needless to say. Right. Am I remembering my Aristotle right when he says that the, the political, like political thinking, political thought is at the top of the mountain, that that is the highest pursuit the best pursuit, yeah, the one to, that should bring you the most utility and happiness and knowledge. Yeah, it's it's one of the peaks of one of the mountains, but it's definitely a peak of a mountain. There's a question there of, uh, there's an age-old question of the primacy of the political life to the philosophical life, and whether or not you need the peak of the political life to experience the peak of the philosophical life. But no doubt, reflection mm -hmm. on politics, on ethics, on law, on community, on the lawgiver, on the virtues, excellence, justice, and everything that is at the heart of political life, no doubt, is one of the two peaks, if there are two, in Aristotle. Got it. And so the third element here is accepting the divinity of, of human life. Um, is, that, is that bringing in necessarily concept of spirituality and religion into this fourth political, fourth political theory? No, and I would say... Or if you could explain yeah, that so to me. Yeah, so there is... Okay, he puts it like this. He says, if we reject liberalism, communism, and fascism, we make available the things that they rejected. One of the things that they rejected is archaics, traditionalism, revelation, divinity. They had maybe each of them had their own watered down version or somehow narrow version. But the whole resource, all of the resources of mythological thinking, again, traditional thinking, religious thinking, 
And it need not be uh, religious rationalism, deism, Protestantism. Suddenly it puts on the table again, doesn't force feed this, but it puts it on the table. Uh, all forms of mysticism, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, magic, okay, all the mechanisms and modalities of religious thought that may have been in the underground in modernity, if not completely rejected. So first of all, those become available for our study and reconsideration. And Dugan has a book, In Search of the Dark Logos, where he looks at Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Kabbalistic thinking, alchemy, and these other things that for liberal rationalism would definitely be just uh, definitely crackpot domain, right? You do not take that stuff yeah. seriously, uh, even if you're even aware of its existence. So that's number one. He puts right. it on the table, um, but it's not. But it's also not jumping to theology and divinity right away, because again, there too, what is the soul? Right, all of the, they're all open questions in a sense. The simple for a Russian Duganist, the simplest thing is to just say, okay, I'm going to identify with my traditional religious uh, identity, Russian Orthodoxy, and there you go. So Russia is distinct from the West because the West is Protestantism and Catholicism, and we're Eastern Orthodoxy. End of story. I'm Russian Orthodox. There you go. That's my cultural distinction. But and Dugan allows for that at one level. But again, as you always see, there are these multiple levels. So at, at one point he says, and this is available in English in the book called Political Platonism. He says that there should be a reconsideration of the origins of Christianity and of the various schools and debates in Christianity. But all of that will be proceeding blindly if it doesn't know Plato and Neoplatonism. Because all of those early Christian thinkers, somehow you get the blueprint or the matrix of their thought in at least Plato and Neoplatonism, broadly speaking. So when he says, I, I, I had mentioned that one of the basic views of, uh, of fourth political theory is that divinity is not rejected, right? It's just, it's not, it's on the table. It's not a materialism. It's not an atheism. It somehow allows for that transhuman domain, domain. But it ranges all the way, as I say, from I'm just going to declare my Russian Orthodoxy to be in conformity with my cultural tradition to I now need to do the whole study of Neoplatonism and Plato to understand what was going on with the early church fathers. That's all fair game. What's not fair game is materialism. Just to say there's nothing but the rocks and the trees and the birds. Okay, No other dimension but what you can see and swallow, basically. That is off the table. Um, I think he, he, I should add, though, to the extent that there, that Russia is a unique civilization, this just follows from his model, Russia would also have its unique materialism. So even the forms of like transcendence and materialism, okay, they also will take on different hues somewhat from civilization to civilization. So it's a rich picture. But yeah, it doesn't mean everybody has to believe in God. It means somehow, like I said, an acknowledgement of this other uh, domain, dimension, or aspect of human life is sort of built in again there is a lot there it, it's a little off topic but I, i'm reminded of and just been reading recently the conflict between the founding fathers in, in america uh, not the conflict even but the 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 symbiotic relationship between the the sort of cosmopolitan enlightenment thinkers and the rural uh they were even zionist thinkers at the time in like a revolutionary america people who thought that uh, americans were were actually uh, israel right like they were in the wilderness and they were to god's people and they were there to create new society and and uh, very fervent religious uh, spirit in the countryside of the united states i've been reading sermons from like 1750 and 1760 uh and it's uh it's very intense but there was a, a dance and an interplay between the cosmopolitan folks of the city who wanted to embrace these uh, enlightenment and, and and thinking and thought and liberalism and create this new country and have the revolution uh but but, uh, you know, it was a, an alliance. It was a dance. And uh, it's interesting to me that I have to go back and rediscover uh, those re that relationship between uh, the very religious groups that were on the ground at the time uh, and, you know, the, the separation of church and state and this whole concept that we think of today where that the United States government uh, isn't uh, involved in or, or 
founded by or you know supports uh, religious thinking when really the whole revolution was had very serious heavy religious undertones and overtones uh, and those things uh, all sort of gotten lost and what's interesting for me in my personal uh, upbringing is uh my my mom's side of the family was catholic but she sort of was you know reformed she lost it and my dad's side was jewish and i was bar mitzvahed but then i sort of lost it and uh and so now i'm i'm i grew up um without any kind of religion and without any kind of real spirituality and now i've been taking time to actually go back and look and learn and read and understand and and i've been developing a much greater appreciation or for for that uh, type of thinking and these processes and starting to put things in a historical context you know like a guys guys like plato and aristotle uh, what did the what do the christian christian scholars think about you know, is, is Aristotle in heaven? You know, he wasn't saved by Jesus. Right. But like, it seems, you know, the thinking is very similar and right all along the same line. So it's just fascinating to me to see these questions from two and 3000, 4,000 years ago to, you know, American revolution to fourth political theory. Uh, all of these questions still, still circulating. And none, of them, none of them necessarily answered. Am I right about that? We haven't answered any of these questions yet. Well, Michael? you know, Strauss has this essay called Progress or Return, and it's the sort of the logic of return, returning to the questions, returning to the roots, returning to the age old fundamental problems of human life and of human political life, of law, of how history can be distorted or created or rewritten, what gets left out when founding fathers have debates among themselves about what's fundamental. So. Uh, it sounds like you and I and Dugan and Heidegger Strauss, each in their own way, you know, has has gone to the logic of return, which doesn't just mean going back to what's old and outdated, because these questions are always alive for us. They're always living. They're always giving and they're always uh, worth our time and attention. So it's uh, it's great that, that you're doing that. And I, I think a lot of people are beginning to because they see that they're not satisfied with the answers or even with the questions that are available to them now. And instead of looking yeah forward into an abyss or into some confusion or chaos they're taking their bearings with what uh with the possibilities of return and i think that's a, a worthwhile project well i mean as far as i can tell the science demands these types of questions you know the more you learn about the universe and time and space and the the more it demands these kind of questions and then the happier i am to embrace them and honestly i've been hearing more and more people say uh I grew up without religion. I actually grew up anti-religion. Uh, and today I'm more open to the notion of religion than ever before. And I have that same sentiment. And that comes through what I found to be a rational process, uh, which contradicts everything that I ever had presupposed about spirituality or, or religious thought, that there wasn't a rational thought process involved in it. Uh, but as the more I go through and the more layers I peel back, you know, and the more questions and get down to the fundamental questions, you know, you do have to, what is it, accept the divinity of human life at some point, right? Um, we have covered a tremendous amount of ground here. It's about two hours. Is this, is this a basics? Have we gotten the basics covered? Is there some element that we have left out? Um, do we want to wrap on this? Is there something to expand upon? Where, how would you feel? Do you think I've gotten a 101 intro to Dugan at this point? Is there, or is there something else we need to hit on? I think it's good for a 101. You have the fourth political theory. You have Heidegger, the geopolitics, ethnosociology, its importance for Russia, the notion of many different civilizations, his anti-liberalism, which is a relevant factor for sure, his uh, trying to network and meet with other people who reject liberalism, sometimes for geopolitical purposes, sometimes for theoretical purposes. That's all part of the picture. I think that's good as a 101. I only want to add that it's been important for me, and I think there's a good reason um, to highlight it again. People who listen to you, um, who are hearing this conversation, let's say they know uh, they know Strauss, okay, and somehow m more, let's say, how would you put it? Like, if Dugan still seems far out and far off and kind of wild or crazy, because you can still take this conversation, go look at him online and still think, no, there's no way we're talking about the same guy here. The look, you know, <laughs> but I just want to say that the problem of the political meaning of philosophical supremacy, the problem of reconsidering the crisis of modern rationality, the problem of digging into alternatives that are neither 
fully collapsible to liberalism, communism, or fascism is just so important for us to do. And Dugan is not the only one. Strauss and others are doing the same. People on the left, people on the right. These are questions that are alive for us, and we should be willing to look at whoever's making a contribution to that question. I think you've done an admirable job getting Dugan 101 across, and I hope that your listeners find him to have been a good contribution to the discussion. Well, I sincerely appreciate your time and your effort. Uh, I can certainly relate to your experiences uh, with your PhD and cancel culture and just the just running into just a a complete disrespect for intellectual exploration, basically, uh, and the the elimination of of uh, of a play space intellectually, uh, and the elimination of the opportunity to explore and express. Uh, without having everything that you do or say or person you talk to be established as your personal lifelong canon, that which should be on your tombstone and which you should be judged by at all moments in time. I can certainly uh, appreciate that experience that you had. I've had it. Lots of people are having it. We're having our own uh, um, Dugan-esque moment of, you know, the walls come, come crumbling down and you're left wondering what is important, who is important, who's right, who's wrong. I can imagine for you, you know, if you grew up wanting to be a PhD, uh, having the ac uh, academy in such high esteem, you set your goals on it, you were probably dreaming about it when you were younger, and then you get there and you become disillusioned. And now you've yourself had m a moment of sort of in the wilderness and trying to figure out what you think and, and where you want to go and how you want to pursue your intellectual you know, a journey and, and your process. And so I think uh, I find a lot of community uh, with people like yourself and others who have been willing to take those risks. Uh, you know, I suspect that this is a risky conversation for me to have uh, if I were a normal, quote, normal person. But, you know, I don't care. I love this kind of stuff on the edge. And frankly, you have really put into context a lot of some of the other conversations that I've had earlier with Bronze Age Pervert, uh, with Ryan Williams from uh, the Claremont Institute, uh, it put um, helping me understand the Straussian perspective and Dugan. And, and so I really uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hopefully we can do this again after uh, this has sunken in. Maybe we can do a, a 102 class after this, maybe get into Heidegger a little bit more uh, as I my, my interests uh, turn in that direction as well. Uh, but thank you very much, Michael. I sincerely appreciate it. Where can people find you? Uh, how can they uh, interact with you? What's your website, Twitter handle, all that stuff? MichaelMillerman.ca is my website. You can see some of my writings and interviews and videos there. And I'm on Twitter. Um, it's M underscore Millerman. So I'm on Twitter. You can feel free to ask me questions there if there's anything you want to follow up with or just write to me and I'd be happy to see you there. So that's that's really it. I awesome. have videos up on YouTube, but it's all through michaelmillerman.ca. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, JackMurphyLive.com, Liminal Order, Liminal-Order.com, Democrat to Deplorable. That's the book. Check it out. Hit subscribe. See you guys next time. Jack Murphy Live Show. Michael, thank you so much. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. <laughs>